hang on. Can we get the uh, lecture and mic on? Lectern. Need a podium, Mike. Well, Chuck is good morning, everybody. We don't have our sound man with us today. Chuck's not feeling very good, so keep him up in prayer. Good morning. Is that good? Yep. Perfect. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Welcome to the net. We're going to read a scripture. It's Proverbs 8, 27, 31. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned the sea, when he signed to the sea its limits so that the water would not transgress his command. When he marked out the foundation of the earth, then I was beside him as a matter as a master craftsman, and I was his daily delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we just want to give you praise, honor, glory, and we know, Lord, that you are in control of our lives, in control of the happenings around us, Lord, and we just thank you that we can come in your presence and um, lift up your praises, Lord. We thank you that you inhabit our praises. And just help us, Lord, to uh, lay down our cares to you. Um, you know each and everyone's burdens in their heart, Lord God. And just help us, Father, to focus on you and uh, a garment of praise for uh, a spirit of heaviness, Lord. We love you. And um, we just give this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a beautiful scripture. Every time I read that, it's such a proof that Jesus is right there in the Old Testament. And it's just beautiful. We're going to declare him throughout the service because he's, he's the only king forever and ever.
our banner Thank you everybody for joining in and singing in his praises. The Lord just delights in praises of his people.
high above all the names. Hallelujah. Praise Hallelujah. You are Lord forever. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord. We lift our voices and worship you, Lord. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our praise.
We're going to do a new song. Upon him. A beautiful hymn. Talks about our great Savior, the great love he has for us. And it just displays the gospel right out there. This is great.
Get down. 
give you thanks, Lord, for this time together. We can sing your beautiful praises, Lord, and that you would be glorified in us and in your service. And we quiet ourselves, and if anyone here has a word or scripture they'd like to share. were questioning Jesus about John's ministry and he told him this parable no one tears a patch from a new garment and sews it on an old one if he does it will tear the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old and no one pours new wine into old wine skins if he does the new wine will burst the skins and the wine will be ruined no new wine must no new wine must be poured into new wineskins and no one after drinking old wineskins wants the new for he says the old is better this is my word to you my son my daughter the old wineskins i have something new for you in this hour if you stay in the old white skins, it becomes hard and brittle, and it will break if you try to pour the new into the old. My son, my daughter, close this chapter to your life. Let me bring in the new wine skin to pour into your life, into your marriage, into your situation, whatever it might be. For I will give you new wine, and I will pour in the new, and I will heal that chapter of your life that you have closed. But you must close it. You have to close it. And also with my church, don't, let's not try to pour the new wine into the old. In this hour, I'm pouring out a new wine a new purpose and a new hour for my church. And my church will preach the full counsel of God and tell of the great wow. salvation yes. that I did yes. and the finished work of the cross. Right. But let go of the old. Let the chapter close. Go forward in this hour. Let me pour out the new wine. I am pouring out new wine in this hour. Amen. Have a seat, everyone. Praise God. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to the Fisherman's Net this morning. Um, you'll see the first thing on our announcements this morning is uh, our youth calendar sale today. Um, youth calendar today, it says. So it's our sale today. So I'm going to have, uh, have a couple of our youth come up and tell us all about it. Um, I'm Aaron. So we are selling calendars for Hands of Hope, and we'll sell them by the back door. 
um, the Hands of Hope has a new child care center. And then what we liked about the Hands of Hope child care was there are lots of toys for kids of all ages and rooms for all ages. The child care is free for anyone that is having financial difficulties and needs help watching their children. We will be looking forward to going there again. Thank you, guys. So they're, they're going to be doing that sale today. How much are they? It's Thirteen dollars, and that go, all goes to help the Hands of Hope. This is a this is an, like an opportune time because there's probably a lot of a tons of people who need child care right now, and so that it's it just a, it's a times are lining up that that kids can go there and hear about the Lord, and uh, we can we can be a part of that. So if you buy a calendar, you can be a part of that. Um, all of us remember Frank Frontera. He was a member of our church for quite a while, and there's going to be a, um, a memorial for him this Saturday, October 17th, from 1 to 3. It's going to be here at the church, and we're going to remember Frank. So if you can make it, please come, and we'll have a time of uh, memorial for him, and we can. Um, there's going to be a luncheon provided also. Uh, let's see what else we've got going on here. Um, there's, there was a change of the date for the Sunshine Sisters Banquet, so please take note of that. It's been moved to October 25th. And also, please take note that the men's meetings, uh, the schedule has changed. Um, you'll notice on your, on your chairs here, we have this. Uh, this is a Right to Life of Michigan uh, news. And it has a, a, it has a voter's guide. Um, one, of our, uh, one of the things as Christians that we hold dear is, uh, is the right of the unborn and uh, the sanctity of life. And that's a fundamental issue um, on both sides. And so I, I would just encourage you guys to read it, take a look. And um, we can, it, it spells out clearly who is on the side of life. So please take a look at that. Um, let's dismiss our kids for Sunday school, and we'll carry on with the rest of our service. You guys can stand up. We'll pray over you and your teachers. And sorry, there was a hands of hope, uh, child care. I missed that, sorry. A little co coordination. But they, the, the kids go and visit there every year, and it's just a, it's a blessed time for them, and they can... Uh, they can see exactly what's going on, and then it gives them ownership as well. When they're raising money, they see exactly where their money's go, where the money that they're working so hard. They do a bake sale, and and they also do a uh, this calendar sale. So please keep that in mind. I I got a chance to work with some of our guys here at the Macomb County Youth Homes. It's slightly different, but uh, just those few experiences cha can change the way you look at things forever. So. Uh, it's like to give kudos to our youth leader for uh, for thinking that as not just uh, taking but giving back as well. So, let's pray over our kids. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, with grateful hearts that we have um, these young ones in in our midst that want to do do what's right for you, Lord, and that they care about others, Lord. And we ask that that would just be a um, along with your word, Lord, but it would be a call for them to always look to help others, Lord. And, and that's been the nature of our church, the nature of your church, Lord. We want, we want to give and we want to help others, Lord. So we ask that you would sow that in these young hearts to always look outward and that they would be able to uh, see those in need and be, be uh, your hands and feet on this earth, Lord. Uh, we pray that as they go up for Sunday school that they would learn more of you as we learn more of you down here, Lord. We pray for um, all those who are sick in our congregation that, that you would just uh, be with them, Lord, and, and uh, we pray for all those who are viewing online, uh, that you would just uh, let your Holy Spirit just, inc just encompass them as they're at home too. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to come to the Lord for a time of prayer. So we just bring our hearts to him. Uh, for Dwayne, Dwayne Mann had a stroke two weeks ago and just had another one two days ago. Please pray for a complete recovery. For Diane, for healing, continued healing for Diane physically and mentally. For Katie, 
Katie had um, eye cancer and it has spread to her bones. Um, please pray for that. For Peter, pray for Peter who had a serious hip replacement. Please pray for my two kids who are being oppressed because of hurt and anger. Pray for salvation for family members, that God would work in their hearts and minds, for them to want to know him and his presence. And pray for our nation, the church, the upcoming elections, all are worthy of prayer. Pray the Lord awakens us as a people and helps us as the body to be a people in tune with him. So Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus and we lift up all these needs, Lord, knowing that um, you, Jesus, are constantly interceding at the right hand of the Father. We thank you for that. Lord, I just pray for, the, um, for salvation, for those that, um, you know, the family, Father God, that you would soften their hearts, Lord, that you would um, give the, the body, the ones that do know you, Lord, um, new words and a new heart, Lord God, and that they would see those family members that don't know you through your eyes, Lord God, with grace and mercy and love, Lord. You know, you say that uh, they will know us, by our, they'll know us by our love, Lord God. Father God, that those that are, that are struggling with cancer and the, the requests that were lifted up to you, Lord, that you would, um, we do pray for ultimate healing, Lord God. If they do not know you, Father, I pray that through this time that they would come to know you personally and that that would be the truest gift, Lord God, that they would know you. Um, just help them to keep their eyes on you and their hope on you, Lord God, through this situation because you do say that there will be trials and tribulations on this earth. And Father God, for the youth, for the two kids with hurt and anger, Lord, um, I just pray for constant um, a heart for the parents to continue to pray, to continue to lift them up, Lord God, um, that you would bring people in these kids' lives that know you and that can um, minister to them right where they're at, Father God, because you are so personal and that's how you work, Lord. Just work in their hearts. Um, bind their hurts, Lord God, and uh, soften their hearts, Lord, and just show them your love, your love for them, Lord. So we thank you for your sovereignty. We know that you are a good God and you are going to be true to your word and just lift all these needs up, Lord God. And we just thank you in advance. Uh, for the answer of all these prayers, because you are constantly working and moving. So we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Um, I do have a praise report. Um, this is for Buddy. Our dog, Buddy, got loose two days ago. After constant prayer, we got a call from a rescue place saying, we think we have your Buddy. So I have a dog, Eddie, and he's amazing. So this is really a true praise report. So I'm going to put these in back for everybody to um, pick one and pray throughout the week. God bless. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, if you want to have sign up for small groups today, there are sign up sheets at the kitchen uh, counter. And that means that we have uh, an opportunity to uh, form groups that are near where you live so we can gather together for fellowship and uh, prayer. And that's going to become more important. We'll say more about that uh, in a bit. But first of all, before I speak this morning, I want to announce that uh, two of our board members met with uh, two couples in our church to discuss roles of responsibility within the church. We met with Kurt and Suzette Sorrentino to discuss eldership, and also with Lou and Carolyn Napoleon to discuss deaconship. They are both uh, members that are matured in their faith. They're committed to Christ and also committed to this church. And so as we always do, when we have a candidate for eldership, and in the 
matter of uh, Lou and Carolyn, that would be a deacon and deaconess. We place this before the church. Kurt and Suzette Sorrentino, Lou and Carolyn Napoleon. And that would be church leadership. If there's any reason that you know of why they should not be appointed or there is a concern, you can approach myself or you can approach uh, Dennis Elier, who serves on the board, so that if there is no hindrance, then we can go ahead and pray over them and say, as Scripture states, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us to appoint these persons to leadership. Uh, we referred to the Right to Life of Michigan News and it lists here, again, where people stand. I don't want to repeat what's already been said. Take it out and put it in your vehicle. Or ladies, take it out and put it in your purse. Because you know how that works. Doggone it. I left it. I don't even know where it is. I don't even know where it, it, it is. My husband might have thrown it out. But if you take this and just place it in your vehicle, then when you go to vote, it'll just serve as a guide. We don't tell people how to vote in our congregation, but I've lived long enough that, boy, I'll tell you, whenever there's election time, you can see it on the local television, on the national television, politicians standing behind, the, standing at the rostrum, addressing the members of the congregation. And I just know in some circles, they don't care what the, what the Internal Revenue says or what the feds say about there being endorsements. They are there speaking. But for us, again, this serves as a guide. It serves as a guide. Father, we come to you on this beautiful morning in the precious and holy name of the Lord Jesus. And Father, we ask and pray that the Holy Spirit will be our teacher this morning. Give us ears to hear and a heart to understand. In your blessed name we pray, amen. We thank you for the, uh, the utterance given this morning. It resonated uh, with me. And uh, that's the Holy Spirit telling us to prepare ourselves for changes that'll take place. And uh, I, for one, welcome those changes. Well, if we would have the readings, please. Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off him, put his own clothes on him, and led Christ out to crucify him. In Mark 15, there's also verses of scripture that tells us that when he had resurrected, he ascended up into heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. And the disciples who became apostles, along with disciples, went out preaching the word. And it tells us in the final two verses of Mark 15 that the Lord went with them working with them and confirming the word with signs. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I'll not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Thank you. I had the great opportunity <clears throat> recently to uh, speak with a young man who really wanted to find out what had happened when the Holy Spirit had moved among us in our youth. As I heard it stated, in our youth, our hearts were touched with fire. He had sent me a, 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 a nice note and uh, it just said, you know, I always thought the fishermen instead of just being a nice church where our group could meet. And then I began discovering 
how many people that uh, were in my parents' lives had come to know Christ through the fisherman's net and their life transformed. Well, I thanked them for it and just wrote the customary, you know, thank you for your kind words and uh, perhaps one day we can go ahead and meet in Christ, Alex Silva. So he contacts me and just says, I'd like to meet with you. Well, those of you just know, I seldom ever speak about what happened decades ago. And I do it deliberately, because I don't want to be a curator showing people under the display uh, glass, oh, God did this one, and God did this. No, I take the tact, is we need to speak about what Jesus Christ today is doing in people's lives. But this young man really wanted to meet with me, so we got together, I sat across from him, and he brought the matter up. I spoke to him two or three minutes. Well, how are things going with you? He's doing real good. He came back to the subject. Talked to him again a few minutes, changed the conversation. You know, some people can just talk about themselves or talk, they just go <laughs> And I'm not like that. I'm not. Once I leave the pulpit, I'm a good listener. I sit down, I don't mind, I don't have to be the pitcher in every situation. I'm glad once I leave the pulpit to go and be an outfielder. I do weddings and I would always just ask the people planning it, may I sit with Daryl and Sharon Krull? May I sit with Margaret and George Wunchell? Could you sit, seat me near them? Because the one thing is we wouldn't get into heavy conversation. And not that I'm opposed to it, but I've officiated, I've spoken with people. Somebody comes up to me at a wedding once, asks me a question, I'm more than happy to get pulled away. But by and large, I've finished, I'm content just to be as I said. I don't always have to be the pitcher. I'm content to be the outfielder. Well, this young man again, he brings the subject back up again. So I spoke to him and at that point, I could sense that he was genuinely interested. So I began speaking to him about how God had moved on Frank's life and touched him. Frank Majeski, that God had transformed this young man who had been troubled, been in the juvenile home, and uh, had been incarcerated, and God used an employer to help lead him to Christ and change his life. So what I thought, what can benefit this young man sitting across from me? Why well, speak to him on and on about what happened? Oh, I think it was 1970. No, I think it was 72. Son, look, what made Frank effective is he never lost his naturalness. You probably have had opportunities to go to a class reunion, haven't you? I have. And you notice people that you really liked in junior year or senior year, then you get together with them. And that person that you so liked is now sophisticated, is now just talking about what he and his wife do when they go to Florida, they go here, they got a second home up north. And the thing that you so liked about them, their naturalness, they've lost. So don't lose your, don't lose that. Thank you, that's good. And a couple of other things that I mentioned that could help him. And then conversation went on to other things, a few other things. But I thought, now at this point in my life, like Elijah of old, he confronted the false prophets, he confronted King Ahab, God used him to help raise up a school of prophets. But then, towards the end of his life, Elisha calls him my father. And so, we become fathers in the faith. And fathers in the faith know him that's from the beginning. We should be as we mature, being able to see the bigger picture. So in a word, a young man approached me, wanted to speak with me about what had happened here when we were young. Talked to him a few minutes, turned the conversation back to him. He turned it back again. Wanted to ask some more questions, answered his questions in specificity, went back to, well, how are things going with, with what you're doing? He turned it back again. And I talked to him gave him just a few minute conversation that as best as I could, that could capture what God did in the lives of other people. And what good, what we learned that can help him to be effectual now, now 
and he thanked me, said, I'd like to do this again. I, th I said, that's just great. Today we're speaking the risen Lord in the midst of his church. The fellowship of the gospel. You know, we've been speaking about heaven, and uh, we spoke about things that are continuous in heaven, that Christ sits at the seat of the Father, ever interceding, ever mediating for us. And Greg, my brother Greg gave such a great explanation, biblical foundation for heaven, that I thought, well, that's, all, that's, that's been covered, man. Where do I go with this? I thought, well, I can cover constants that happen in heaven. And there's worship in heaven, and he ever, seeds, ever intercedes for us. I thought, the risen Lord in the midst of his church. And Mark covers it in his last, God, in the final verses, that Christ ascended, sits at the right hand of God. And yet in the next verse, it tells us that he's working alongside his messengers, confirming the word with signs. And uh, as we discuss this passage of scripture, it won't be a long scripture uh, uh, lesson this morning. But the point just being is that Christ continues to be with us, and we should really understand the ways and means uh, behind that. Christ tells that band of disciples in the upper room, I'll ask the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, unseen yet deeply personal, closer to us than even our own breath. He'll dwell within you. I will come to you. When Christ dies on the cross, his final words are, it is finished. His work of redemption is completed. And on that cross, he reveals the great love that God demonstrates by the giving of his son. Pure, a spotless lamb, slain not only to cover the present sins, but the sins of men, past, present, and future. To remove sins, and he's called the Lamb of God. At the beginning of the gospel, we all know the story. The heavenly messenger is sent, and Gabriel comes to Mary, a young girl, a peasant girl, and hail. Mary, thou full of grace. And as he begins to speak to her, that she is going to, she's been chosen to bear the Son of God. So, well, how will this be? And of course, it's concise what Gabriel tells her. And then he adds these words. That holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. When we get to Matthew 27, Christ dies. John tells us his final words are, it is finished. And we're told that the earth shook. And it shook with such power that rocks were cracked. And uh, there was a great rush of wind that people were affrighted. The Roman officer and the soldiers accompanying him, that, that platoon, just said, truly, this man was the Son of God. And so, with the risen Lord in the midst of the church, the Gospels complete their accounts at the beginning, we're told, the Son of God, that will be his title. At the end, the Gentiles are saying, truly this man was a Son of God. The veil separating the Holy of Holies from people gathering to worship that was rent from the top to the bottom, so it just hung right there. It tells us, moreover, that the graves of many, of people that were righteous, were opened, and they appeared unto many in the holy city. I mean, it was a momentous thing that takes place. It was Haskell Stone, who was uh, a Christian leader, Jewish man, and for many years, he was uh, an official 
for the city of Detroit government, and he led a scripture study at the courthouse, federal courthouse downtown. And uh, he always just, in speaking of Christ, he says, there's just no way that our people, Jewish people, would risk livelihoods, their standing in the community, their homes for a dead Jewish carpenter. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen now. It wouldn't happen back then. That people would lose their standing. That people would lose their livelihoods. That people would lose risking their homes for a dead Jewish carpenter. No, he's the God-given Savior for all men. I remember hearing that, and it's powerful. Just powerful. The gospel they complete their accounts. And when Christ dies on the cross, is buried, and he resurrects, the great apostle Paul tells us that's what results in our being forgiven and the covering of our sins. His, declaration, his resurrection declares him the son of God. His shed blood provides atonement for us. The book of Revelation tells us, I'm laying this down here in a few minutes because I want to speak on the fellowship of the gospel but just bear with me. In the fifth chapter of St. John's, the book of Revelation, it provides heaven's response to the Christ, resurrected manhood, that when he ascended, he ascends in human form. And so the man who sits, the Son of God who sits at the right hand of the Father is resurrected manhood. His work is completed, and his title is the Lamb, the Lamb. I once asked a Jewish rabbi, he taught at uh, Macomb College, thoroughly familiar, he, he uh, checked the stores if they were observing kosher law. Orthodox. And I saw him one day, I came over to him, and course, I was asking him different questions. I remember one, asking him one question. I says, Rabbi uh, Goldstein, I, says, I have a question for you. Uh, the sacrifice of, of animals, what place did that have in Judaism? He says, Alex, when they offered up an animal sacrifice, he said, a man was saying, God, for my sins, I ought to die. But here, take this animal in my place. And I've never forgotten that. I was maybe 20 years old when I heard him tell me that, and I've never forgotten it. So when we look at the lamb, he died for our sins. And Christ tells his followers then and his followers now, listen, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. When we pray, it's Jesus Christ who carries out the answer. God grants to his son this tremendous power because when he ascends, he receives omniscience, all wisdom, and he receives omnipotence. And the wisdom that he exercised in a limited sphere while on the earth, he exercises it now in an unlimited sphere. The Father delights in glorifying his Son. The Son delights in revealing the Father. If we can uh, turn on our reading, I just spoke some of the verses out of memory. So if we could go to uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 7. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, the Lord, and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. 
But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Good. Thank you. The glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul receives an understanding of the risen Christ and then the task of making this knowledge known. The risen Christ in the midst of his church. Paul speaks of a glorious gospel and this gospel is of Christ who is in the image of God. God the Father commanding light to shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I'd like to include in some minutes the thoughts of John Piper. I've been reading some of his material and been quite impressed with it. A view of the gospel that's widespread is what God did for us, the extent that God gave to provide forgiveness, a way for sinful man to be reconciled to God, to be able to approach a holy God. And it speaks to us of our value and our worth. Let me say it again. There's a view of the gospel. I don't have an objection to any of this. Of what God did for us, the extent that God gave to provide forgiveness, a way for sinful men, mankind, to be reconciled to God, to be able to approach a holy God. And it speaks to us of our value, of our worth. The glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. And when we speak of the fellowship of the gospel, for the fisherman's net, it's in our DNA because God transformed with a young man and his employer as he testified publicly. His employer, a young guy, sharp guy, I met him when he was Roger bought all of us guys, met him when he was probably in his early 30s. Not Frank Majeski, his employer. Drove a Cadillac, lived well, made a lot of money, had a business right near the tech center. And out of his own admission, I was a skirt chaser. Took a liking to Frank, brought him in, sponsored him in his schooling. He came to work for me. And it got so bad what I was doing that my wife left me. And I was broken. And she had, in the face of all this, kept turning to God, asking God for help. And then she turned her life over to him. And when my wife consents to meet with me, she tells me, Jim, you need to turn your life over to God. And he does. And the power of the gospel transforms Jim's life. And so he begins speaking to Frank. Now, Frank and him, Frank loved Jim, kept him out of jail. I mean, was just a good guy. Frank admired him. And it's Frank's employer, so he can't tell him, leave me alone. So he'd witness to Frank and witness to him. Finally goes down, goes to the meeting, and of all people, a Catholic nun begins speaking with Frank. Frank, you've got to give your life to Jesus Christ. Frank is so steeped in what he's doing. He's steeped. Frank and I, you know, we just, we got along real, real good. We just understood each other. I mean, some of the people that Frank associated with, you know, they could come up and intimidate somebody. Hey, man, give me that coat. Give it to me. I said, well, well I come from in the inner city. I say, man, that's a nice coat, man. Can I have it? But our hearts were bonded, and we fellowshiped. We grew together in our faith. And as Frank just continued to grow, we understood the power of the gospel. Because some churches grow because they got big everything. So people are inviting people, and they're coming. But the fishermen's net, this modest church, really was birthed out of the message of the gospel. 
And so all of us just know it's power to be able to transform people's lives. If I do a funeral, I'll always include praying, praying. We want to conclude our service with a prayer of committal. If you're here, let's pray for the family, the, the mourners, but let's pray right now, too, to receive Christ into our life. It's, it's just there. It's within us. And because of the Son, because of this glorious gospel, we can gather around the Father's knees as his children in intimacy, in awe, in reverence, because Jesus Christ has made this possible. With a reckless belief, and I gotta remind myself at times because I can get weighed down by my sins. And we always need to remember, don't be content with your sins, don't be defeated by your sins. Don't be content with them, and don't be defeated by them. Just keep coming back. Jesus, I'm a pauper. And I am brought into a clear understanding of how much I need you. We can speak about years past, and way back, way back, 50 years ago, my life was transformed by Jesus Christ. But to have the fellowship of the gospel is really to be able to see, I came to really understand its power, its glory, it's majesty. It's ability to change my life years after I receive Christ into my life. Then I've come to really understand and appreciate this gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we can't, by desire, become conscious of spiritual reality. We can't do it. I mean, I try sometimes, you know, Lord, I'm just, man, I'm a sinner. You know, I mean, some people can walk around just, I'm no good, I'm no good. Jesus, the baby just said his first words. What did he say? I'm no good. <laughs> but the thing for each and every one of us is to see that there are times when God just shows to us how destitute we are of the Holy Spirit, how ignorant we are of what Jesus Christ stands for. We're confronted with our poverty. And it's at those moments that we just say, God, how I need you and how I want you. And the power of the gospel, the gospel, what that means, comes to us with greater clarity. Let me say this again. The power of the gospel that I'm speaking to you about today is not just what happened 50 years ago and way back and it was just great. This person came and that person came. Yes, it's glorious. Yes. But I've come to understand and appreciate the gospel in the years, in the decades following the first time it impacted my life. And there's some outcomes from that. We come as we look at the cross with a reckless belief, and I gotta remind myself that the redemption is complete. That we speak of the platform of redemption, the right of his atonement, but we put these things in Bible language, love covers a multitude of sins. What a glorious, glorious phrase in scripture. Now, let me get to the matter at hand. In our culture, it's prevalent all around us. The belief, the practice, that love is demonstrated. John Piper opines, making much of a person. The me culture results in our children being made much of. Parenting skills, motivating skills, selling techniques, being made much of. So to feel that you're loved is to be made much of. 
we come into Christ and people can be man-centered or God-centered. I came, Christ touched my life. I'm still self-centered, man. I'm still, we're dying to self. We're dying to self. But the culture that we're growing up and our kids are growing up, and the grandparents, I mean, you know, for the, for the kids, I mean, they come, we're happy to bless them with little gifts, being made much of. I mean, that's what grandparents, I, was, I wasn't so nice and generous and kind and thoughtful and, and forbearing with my sons as I will be with the grandchildren. It's the truth. And in the fellowship of the gospel, we're bound together by a common interest. Fellowship, we're bound together by a common interest of value and experience. The remaining minutes, I'll get to the heart of the matter. God, God the Father, God the Son. That's the gift of the gospel. It's the gift of the gospel. If God is not the greatest treasure, then we'll believe in the gospel, we'll, we'll walk a Christian walk, but we'll look beyond him for satisfaction. You know, some questions to just ask is just, men can be God-centered as long as he is man-centered. You follow me? Because I have such value, I have such worth. Because to be loved is to be made much of. And so the focus is on us, what he's done for us. My value, my worth. But if we look at it and just see, God gave his only begotten son and he died on the cross so that we can approach him, that we can have fellowship with him. So a God would, who would do that, to go that, that great extent, then I want to get to really know him because its purpose wasn't just simply to forgive me and that I can go to heaven, but to be able to come freely to him and that he come becomes my greatest treasure. Two groups of people, they love God, they approach him, but one comes influenced by the world, our culture, man-centered. Of course, I love, I love the gospel, I love it, because it speaks, God speaks to me of my value, my worth. The other one tells us, that we see the value, the worth of God Almighty. We don't get there because I spoke on this today, but it can be something that we aspire to. It's something that we aspire to. Because you ever notice that self-centered people are not happy? Oh, no, no, you've got to be really uh, careful. They're very sensitive. No. I'm 70 years old, going to be 70. They're not sensitive. They're self-centered. And so, from the four, first sin in the Garden of Eden to Judgment Day, men will continue to embrace the love of God as a gift. But really, to fully embrace the gospel is to embrace him. Because it really is an error to believe that wanting to be happy means wanting to be made much of. As we mature in our appreciation of God, we'll mature in seeing that the principle of the cross was in the heart of God before creation, to lay himself down to walk alongside us while we're struggling with, with things in our life. Struggling. That we're so capable of doing such dark deeds. Dark deeds. When I became a Christian, I understood darkness. And coming to Christ, we see that the heart of God, there was the cross. 
if the heart, if the worth of, of, of self is front and center, then we miss the worth of God. Let me put it to you another way. I love John Piper, the way he puts things. He says, Americans and people beyond our nation's borders, they travel to visit the Grand Canyon. Men from all over the world travel to see the Alps, not to increase self-esteem, but to behold great splendor. And so, we don't go for a greater self, but to behold something that transcends, transcends us. And its glory, its majesty. If knowing and enjoying God himself is not our greatest joy, then that weakens his worth and really steals our final satisfaction. It just does. How many parents are held hostage I heard a discussion about it over the weekend to their children's happiness. And really, there's no substitute. They have to bow the knee to us. They have to bow the knee to Christ. That's it right there. I mean, you know, they could, well, they prayed the self sinner's prayer a long time ago. They don't think biblically. They don't act biblically. And problems are in the, in the household. Problems are in the household. You get the me culture and our own human nature to be loved is to be made much of. And so we have to point our children that it's God. Don't ever forget the three C's because it helps keep me free. You didn't cause it. You can't control it. You can't change it. They have to bow the knee to Christ. You can run interference. You can spend money out of pocket to pay for the lawyer. To pay. They have to bow the knee to Jesus Christ. Until that happens, things will be out of step because they're out of step with God. And God's given us the Ten Commandments and the words of Christ. If you blow those things off, Watch out, because those are our guardrails, our God guard rails. So in closing, it's the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. The gospel contains that component of the forgiveness of our sins. And in revisiting forgiveness of our sins, we see the great extent that God gave to provide forgiveness for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And when we come to God, the near miss, it's just thank you, thank you, thank you. I receive every one of it 10,000 blessings you give the bride. Thank you. I thank you. I'm so blessed. I'm so special. I'm so... Or else, did you say, God, you've demonstrated how worthy you are of a being that I want to get to know you and love you because this glorious gospel is the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Can we put on those final three readings? I left my notes at home, so I'll just do them by memory. It'll be better anyway. <laughs> and he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which a father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. The next reading. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And our final reading, now Saul was consenting to his death, speaking of Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 
I belong to a prayer group, and we've been meeting for almost a quarter of a century. Pastors from the burbs, pastors from the, from, uh, the city. We meet and pray. And because we do, we never pray for small things. We aren't praying for our own congregations. We pray big. We pray big. Examples, we pray for the VA. We pray for the mayor of the city of Detroit. We pray for our governing officials. We pray for the judiciary. We pray for our upcoming elections. There's never a prayer for me and my, you know, tooth. It's, it's always big. We pray big. And so we compare notes. Then they that feared the Lord spake one with the other, and the Lord gave heed and heard. And in comparing notes, the director of Life Challenge sent me just a, a site and says, listen to this. It's Pastor Tim Delena of New York. Their congregation is uh, in New York City. And in a word, what he spoke of is the title, Processing Crisis. The passages I just read here. And he says, in New York, my kids, they're just concerned. When are things going to be normal again? There's a concern, and he pointed out, they're concerned about Broadway being closed, restaurants being closed. I mean, when are we going to come back to normal? And he just said, I don't move in the prophetic, but I'm going to step out right now. Because I believe that this is not, this pandemic is not an interruption, but a disruption from God for us to prepare ourselves. The first passage we read is that God instructed the apostles or the disciples at that point and he just tells them that they await in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father and that they're going to take that message to Judea, Samaria and the ends of the earth. The second passage of scripture, what was their response to the message, the apostolic message on the day of Pentecost? And they continued in apostolic doctrine, the teaching of the apostles and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. That is the process. Because right now, they can't meet in New York for church. They can't meet. I mean, he's speaking to, there's nobody sitting there. He's speaking into a camera. And in Acts 8, a great persecution arose. And what happened? They're scattered. No church services. No children's ministry. No gathering. They're scattered. But you hear two words that were said by Jesus. You're going to take the message to Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. And in Acts chapter 8, when they're scattered and they took the message to Judea and Samaria. The process that just seems like we're so busy, I, I, I can't go to Bible study, I can't do this, I, I, I'm busy. But that process, listen, of abiding in the apostles' doctrine, of breaking of bread, taking communion, of fellowship and prayer is what prepared them for what happened in Acts chapter 8. Because if we don't do that process, when the crisis comes, we'll respond to it emotionally and will come out of it damaged and bitter. So the crisis provides depth to the Christian. The process provides longevity. As he spoke to, he says, I believe this is a word for our church but actually the church beyond. Pastor Wilkerson, I had the privilege to have him speak to our congregation. I became his son's friend when his son pastored here. 
and uh, he, he moved in the prophetic. Never considered himself to be a prophet. And the man who assumed the mantle after him moved in that prophetic. He says, I don't. I don't move in the prophetic. But he says, I'm stepping out because I really believe that God is preparing us for persecution. I'm not saying it's going to happen. He said, it's not going to happen in the next year or two. We don't know. But God is preparing us for persecution. And if we don't participate in the process, then when the crisis comes, we'll respond emotionally. And what will happen is we'll come out of it damaged and bitter. But if we abide in those process, we're preparing ourselves for what will come. So he urged the members of his church to get involved in small groups. And as he was completing, he said, we are the church. We're neither left to the left or we're neither to the right. We are the people of God. And so if we have ears to hear, hearts to understand, we will just see this, not as an interruption. Oh, when are things going to come back? Yeah, some of these stupid masks and do this, do that. I'm glad nobody's laughing. That's good. But what we'll be doing is looking at this as a disruption that God is preparing us for what lays ahead. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we've just been challenged in, in, in a, in, I trust in a good way, Father, that Lord, we don't want to get the near miss. But Father, we don't want to stay in the shallows as we're so apt to do, including myself, to stay in the shallows. But Lord, we pray to move into the depths of the ocean of God's love. And that Lord, we're so grateful for the cross. We're so grateful for the mercy that it provides us. We're so thankful that you saw mankind of such worth that we were worth dying for. But all that is to say, Father, is we want to see the greatness of a God that would do this for us. And that, Lord, we would run beyond the blessing, beyond the gift, to this wonderful giver who would give so much, lavish so much upon our lives. Lord Jesus, we bless your holy name. Lord, continue to reveal the Father. And dear God, help us to share in the glorifying of your dear Son to honor your blessed name. Lord, as we concluded, we spoke words of exhortation Help us to take it to heart, and Lord, let that be a compass point for us in our lives at this point. Thank you for a glorious gospel that becomes more endearing to us, more meaning to us than when we first heard it. In Jesus' blessed and strong name, amen. Well, good, good. Can we have our musicians come up, and we'll finish up our uh, service. <coughs> Coming to my house after, uh, please just uh, come over about 12:30, please. We're having a meal for Brother Daryl.
I'm calling it the Last Supper. <laughs> but he's going to be uh, moving away from us, and we just like to tell him how much he's meant to us. Well, let's sing. Should we stand? So amazing. Love so amazing. 